We've done it. <laughs> We've done it, baby. Put your arm on. I had no idea it would be so huge. It's like something from another world. It's warm. Is it the bell, though? The one in the story? Well, bring the lamp closer. Paul said there were scenes from the life of Christ carved on it. There seems to be something just above the rim. Help me scrape the mud off. My God, look. It must be a nativity scene. There's the ox and the ass. And there's the scene with the fisherman. And there they are sitting at a table having their last supper. And here's the crucifixion. And the resurrection. There's something written. So there is. It's in Latin. Tell me what it says. Vox ego sum amoris. Gabriel Bokor. I am the voice of love. I am called Gabriel. Gabriel. That was the bell's name. It is the bell. <gasps> oh, Toby, you are marvellous. You're an absolute hero. I am the voice of love. Toby. Oh, Dora. Dora. Oh, oh Toby, Toby. <sighs> Somebody's bound to have had that. up with you. Why are you wandering about at this ungodly hour? I couldn't sleep. And then I looked out of the window and I saw someone walking along the causeway. I, I, I didn't realize it was you. Something the matter? Yes, Michael. Something is the matter. Dora's vanished. I woke up and found her gone. I thought I'd better see where she'd got to. Did you hear an extraordinary sound just now? Yes, I was falling into a gorse bush at the time. What was it? No idea. It sounded like a bell. A bell? There's a light on at the lodge. I know, I saw it. That's where I was going. I thought Dora might be there. Oh. Or if she isn't, I'd be interested to know whether Toby Gash is in his bed. The two of them have been going around like a couple of conspirators for the last few days. They're up to something. Do you mind if I come with you? Not in the least. The more, the merrier. <coughs> Good evening, Greenfield. Ah. So you brought your chaperone along with you. To what do I owe the pleasure? Good evening, Fawley. I was just wondering if my wife was here. No, she ain't. Why should she be? Uh, lie down, Murphy. Have a drink. Thank you, no. I never take whiskey. Michael? No, thanks. Is Toby upstairs? No, he ain't here either. Any idea where he is? No, I'm not Gash's keeper. Then I'll be going. It was odd what you said about hearing a bell. Why? Because there's a legend about this place. The sound of a bell portends death. Nick, did you hear that strange sound a little while ago? I heard nothing. I'll say good night, then. Sorry to have disturbed you. Mm. One of the deadlier sins. What? Jealousy. Do you want to know where Toby is? Well, where is he then? He's in the woods, making love to Dora. How do you know? I saw them. I don't believe you. Anyway, it isn't any business of mine. Oh, yes, you do. And it is your business, isn't it, Michael? You're our spiritual leader. We don't want the boy to give in to temptation, do we? There's something tremendously satisfying about picking tomatoes. So red, so firm. I wonder if tomatoes grew in the Garden of Eden. I don't recall any mention of them. So, tell me, Michael, 
How did last night's Midsummer Night's Dream come to an end? Rather tamely, I'm afraid. <laughs> and when Paul got back to his room, Dora had returned. She said there was such a hot night that she couldn't get to sleep and she'd been for a walk around the lake. <laughs> I'm afraid that Mrs. Greenfield is what is popularly called a bitch. James. Uh, I'm sorry to say so. But we must call things by their right names. And you didn't hear any strange noises in the night at all, James? Not a sound. I'm so tired these days, I sleep like the proverbial log. Even the last trump wouldn't wake me. <laughs> They'd have to send a special messenger. It was such a strange sound. I could have sworn it was a bell. I can't really believe that anything very serious happened last night. All the same, I think we ought to keep an eye on things. Yes, we should. I'm sure Toby and Dora have done nothing wrong but run around together like a couple of youngsters. Dora is just about his mental age, anyway. But with a woman like that, you can't be sure that there wouldn't have been something that might have upset him. He's been a very sheltered child. The boy's first intimations of sex are important, don't you think? And tampering with the young is a serious matter. Quite. It's a pity that we've made so little impression on Mrs. Greenfield. I wish you'd have a talk with Mother Claire. That girl's just a great emotional mess at the moment. I feel we've let Paul down, rather. Possibly. After all, we're fully responsible for the boy. Of course, there's nothing seriously amiss in his rampaging round with Dora in a companionable way. But I think someone ought to put in a word. Who to? To Dora, I'd say. Appealing to Dora's better nature may turn out to be a difficult operation. I feel that girl is rather a blunt instrument at the best of times. And she also resembles the young man of Dijon. Qui n'avait aucune religion. <laughs> but even if she doesn't care about her husband's blood pressure, she ought to show some respect for the boy. Suppose you gave her a little kindly admonition, Michael. Not me. Oh, how about Margaret? But here is Margaret. Ah! I thought I might find you here, Michael. The abbess wants to see you at once. Oh, I say. You are in luck. And the bell's arrived. The lorry's coming up the drive with it now. Excellent. And what time are we expecting the bishop? Well, about three o'clock. Oh. That was the last message we had. <laughs> We're arranging a buffet tea for him after the baptism of the bell. And he's staying the night here. What a treat. We are privileged. But you'd better be on your way, Michael. It wouldn't do to keep the abbess waiting. I'm glad to see you. I hope I've not chosen an inconvenient time. Uh, no, no, it, it's a good time for me. <laughs> Is everything going to plan? We are all so excited we can hardly wait for tomorrow. After a silence more than 400 years, our bell will ring out again. <laughs> I'm afraid our little procession to escort the bell to the Abbey may be a bit wild and impromptu. I, there's plenty of goodwill, but not much spit and polish. So much the better. When I was a girl, I often saw religious processions in Italy, and they were usually quite chaotic, even the grand ones. But it seemed to make them all the more spontaneous and alive. I hope you're not overworking. You look rather pale. Uh, I'm in excellent health. There'll be a let-up in a couple of weeks, anyway. I'm worried about your young friend at the lodge. Oh? In what way? I know it's very difficult, and of course, I know very little about it. But I feel that he's not getting what he came here for. You may be right. I expect it's largely our fault. But he's dreadfully out of things, isn't he? And will be more so when his sister Catherine is received into the Abbey. Oh, yes, it's very much on my mind. I ought to have done more about it. I'll put someone, uh, James perhaps, uh, seriously on his tail. We'll move Nick up to the house and just make him join in somehow. But I'm afraid he'll only be putting in a little time here. He'll soon be off back to London. Yes, but you know, my son, a man like that does not come to a place like Imber for fun. 
I know that he wished to be near Catherine, but he chose to stay in the community and not to live in the village. We cannot be certain that there is not some genuine grain of hope for better things. And if I may say so, the person who ought to be, as you express it, on his tail is not James, but you. I find him difficult to deal with, but I'll think carefully about it. I confess to you that I feel worried, and I'm not quite sure why. I feel worried about him, and I feel worried about you. I wonder if there's anything you would like to tell me. I don't think so. I know how you grieve over those who are under your care. Those who you try to help and fail, those you cannot help. Have faith in God. And remember he will, in his own way, and in his own time, complete what we so poorly attempt. God can always show us, if we will, a higher and a better way. And we can always learn to love by loving Remember that all our failures are ultimately failures in love. Imperfect love must not be condemned and rejected, but made perfect. The way is always forward, never back. Well, I've kept you too long, dear child. Try not to overwork, won't you? lunchtime reading today, I have chosen a meditation from the devotions of John Donne, which I think you will find not entirely inappropriate. If we understand aright the dignity of this bell that tolls for our evening prayer, we should be glad to make it ours by writing I, 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 In that application... We haven't made any arrangements about when we're going to meet tonight. Who's it he said he'd get the bell hung up over the rafters, but we've got to get it onto the trolley. What am I going to do? Paul won't let me out of his sight for a minute. But he'll have to go back to his work sometime or other. I could write a note to Toby, telling him to meet me at the lodge at 2 a.m. There must be some way I can get it to him. Out of this world. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, you're he a kissed me death. so passionately, just like an eager little boy. Dora. 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 Hmm? If you could spare me the time, Dora, I'd be grateful for your help in attiring the bell. Attiring as soon as you finished your lunch. The bell's in the stable yard. Can we call you will help, won't you? Or a borrowing of as though we were not... <laughs> what on earth is that rat of the bell? <laughs> it looks like an enormous mighty. I made it out of wartime surplus parachute material. Oh. That's a kind of first communion dress for the bell. Now... What I want you to help me with, Dora, are all these white ribbons. They've all got to be tacked down. You can do that, can't you? Yes, I suppose so. Right. If you could start with uh, these ones here. All right. Well, it's so difficult to keep hold of them when the wind keeps pulling them apart. Wouldn't it be better if the bell was taken inside? Oh, no, we can't do that. The bishop will be here at any moment. Oh, it's getting all twisted. I'm so glad that you were able to help me, Dora, because I wanted to have a little chat with you. Oh, yes? I know that you're not used to this sort of place, but it isn't as if you're here on holiday. One must remember that little escapades, which would be quite harmless in another place, do rather matter here. For an inexperienced young person... The kind of thing you got up to last night may be too much too soon. So we must be very careful, mustn't we? That must be the bishop. Oh, gracious me. What are we going to do? At least, 
I suppose it's the bishop. But that car looks vaguely familiar somehow. Laura! Oh, no. Oh, thank heaven for that. It's not the bishop after all. No, it's a friend of mine. I must get rid of him. But Dora, come back. We haven't finished the ribbon. Go away. Go away, Noel. Get back into the car, for God's sake, before someone sees you. I told you not to come here. You ruin everything. Oh, what a charming welcome. Keep your hair on, darling. I've come here to do a job of work. I'm doing a feature on the bell business. Don't you think it's an amazing idea? No, I don't. Please go away, Noel. Paul's here. If he sees you, he'll think I've invited you and there'll be a perfectly beastly scene. Please, darling. You'll only make awful trouble for me. As you know, Dora, I always behave with angelic tolerance where you're concerned. You pop over to see me and be consoled and pop off again when it suits you. And you've got it into your head that old Uncle Noel doesn't mind and he'll always be there waiting for you with a gin and martini. I was very glad to see you the other day, but I was more than unusually peeved when you took it into your head to clear off. But that was because Paul... I have been feeling a little anxious about your state of mind. I thought all these nuns might have been getting inside you. Oh, no, you know very well that I'm... Then it so happens that my editor happens to be an old friend of the bishop who's coming to bless your bell. And the moment he heard what was going on, he asked me to come down here and take a look at it all. So I felt in the circumstances it would be positively frivolous not to. No, I don't care two hoots about your editor. The point is that Paul's here. For goodness sake, go away before he sees you. Paul treats you disgustingly, and you've never really cared for him anyway. And I, I'm not sure I won't give Paul a piece of my mind. You don't know what he's like. You've only seen him at parties. I don't want Paul making a scene in front of the bishop. I couldn't bear it. You can't keep on running away from Paul and then getting frightened and going back and placating him. You must either knuckle under or stand and fight him. And my guess is that once you start a fight, you'll realize that you can't stay with him. And this is where I begin to get interested. You're totally unreliable and, and untidy and ignorant and totally exasperating, but somehow I'd like to see you around the place again. No, you aren't falling in love with me. Let's just say I miss you. It's not out of sight, out of mind anymore, Dora. Look, no, I'm terribly sorry, but I haven't got time for all this just now. I've got something special on, and if things blow up over you, it will spoil it all. So, do be an angel and go away. Sorry, Dora. Just for once, Uncle Noel is going to do what he wants. This is too good an opportunity to miss. Mr. Mead. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm sorry to disturb you, but something awful has happened. Well, how do you mean? Someone I used to know has turned up here, a journalist, to do an article about the bell. When Paul finds out he's here, he'll tear the place up. You must go to him and tell him not to. But, but can't you just persuade this reporter friend of yours to go away again? He won't go, and it's no use your telling him so. What I want you to do is to prevent Paul exploding, especially with the bishop arriving here at any moment. I'm going to tell Paul about it straight away, before he runs into Noel. Oh. Dora, whatever's the matter? Noel is here. Who? Noel Spence, you know. You're telling me that Noel Spence is here. He's come to see you. He's here to do a report on the bell. <laughs> Paul, darling, don't get into a rage. He came here to see you. Did you invite him? Of course I didn't invite him. Do you think I'm mad? He's come to interview people for his paper. Well, he's going to get a nasty surprise. I'll give him an interview he'll never forget. No, Paul, don't. Oh, look, the bishop's arriving. Well, I hope he'll give Noel his blessing. He's going to need it. Paul, it's not my fault. I didn't want him to come. Now get away. <laughs> There are moments when I hate you. Well, 
here I am. I hope I'm not late. <laughs> My charming chauffeur has abandoned me. Uh, a lady, I hasten to say, the exigencies of motherhood called her to a higher task. <laughs> so much to the wear and tear to my nerves and to those of my fellow motorists, I have driven myself to him. <laughs> We're very glad you've managed to come, sir. We know how busy you are. It means a lot to us to have you at our little ceremony. Well, I think it's all most exciting. And is this Exhibit A here on the trolley? Yes, that's the bell, Bishop. We thought we'd deck it up a little. And very pretty it looks. You are Mrs. Strafford, I believe, and you are Mr. Mead. Uh, I've heard so much about you from the abbess, God bless her. Oh, no. I'm James Taper Pace. Mr. Mead. Uh, Please, just having a word with my husband. Uh, we ought to have introduced ourselves, sir. This is indeed Mrs. Strafford Delighted. and Mrs. Greenfield. Hello. Michael Mead is just coming across the grass with Dr. Steady. Greenfield. And uh, I'm afraid I don't know this gentleman. But Noel Spence from the Daily Record. I'm what they call a reporter. How Splendid. I was hoping some gentleman of the press might be present. Uh, did you say the Daily Record? That's right, sir. May I ask if you were put on my track by my old crony, Holroyd? <laughs> I believe he now edits your very distinguished rap. Yes, that's, that's correct. He sends you his greetings. An excellent fellow. In the best tradition of British journalism... Uh, and what is that affair you're carrying on your shoulder? It's a, it's a tape machine. Uh, I prefer to record my impressions at the time rather than rely on my memory. Very wise, I'm sure. I have trouble enough even trying to remember my own name nowadays. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. I have always thought that the church was foolish to shun publicity. What we need is more publicity. Uh, of the right kind, of course. Oh, I do so agree, sir. Well, dear friends, I don't greatly like the look of the sky, so perhaps we should proceed with our little baptism ceremony, without delay. Might I ask who are going to act as sponsors, or should I say godparents, to the bell? That will be Michael and Catherine. Catherine's just coming. I don't know what's delaying, Mr. Mead. He is still talking to my husband. Oh, I'd better go and get him. Uh, Michael, the bishop's waiting. Testing, testing. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, seems to be working okay. Good afternoon, Bishop. Ah, Mr. Mead, I've heard so much about you. I am sorry to have kept you waiting, sir. A little unexpected, urgent business to attend to. Ah, so and my friend has got himself well in with everybody. What the hell does he think he's doing? I told you, Paul. He's doing a reporting job. <laughs> now, please don't be cross. And now, if we are all ready, I think we should proceed. The bell has been dressed up like a costume. Yeah. At least I, I suppose that's the idea of the parachute silk. Um, two sponsors are standing together in front of the bell, looking rather like a bridal pair. Asperges me, Domine, Fisopo et Mundabo, Lavabis me, et super niven de albabo. And the, the bishop is. Scattering holy water on the bell. What name do you desire to put upon the bell? Gabriel. Michael and Catherine, will you each take hold of one of the white ribbons attached to the bell? That's right. Let us remember that the voice of Christ calls us at times to forsake earthly cares, to sit at his feet and learn of higher things. Let this sign be consecrated and sanctified. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 The name of this bell is Gabriel. 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 Let us say together the words of Psalm 150. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his greatness. My letter. My letter to Toby. She must have come out of my pocket. It's blowing across the grass towards no. He's seen it. He's picked it up. How on earth am I going to arrange to meet Toby? Praise him upon the high sounding symbols. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. What have you been doing with yourself? You're soaked. I went for a walk. I'm just going up the change. Toby. 
I want a long and serious talk with you. I haven't got time now, Nick. I've got to go out again. Well, you can spare me half an hour, dear boy. And in fact, you will, whether you like it or not. Sorry, Nick, I've got to go and see somebody. Uh, no, Toby, you're going to listen to me, and to make sure I have your full attention, I'm going to lock the door. Look, Nick, don't be silly. I, I've got to go to the house. We can, we can talk later. Later will be too late, my poor deluded child. Oh, Nick, for God's sake. I told you I would give you a sermon. Well, now is the time. I am filled with the spirit. And lock the door. Oh, come, come, let's have no violence or cross words. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Sit down. Nick, this isn't funny. I've got to go out. Uh, well, since you're in a hurry, we'll cut the hymns and prayers and go straight to the sermon. <laughs> Dearly beloved, we are come of a fallen race. We are sinners all. Gone are the days in the garden, the days of our innocence when we loved one another and what? were happy. Now we are set, each man against his fellow, and the mark of Cain is upon us. And with our sin comes grief and shame. Nick, but I... there is a consolation. And a remedy, the very word of God. I speak, beloved, of the joys of repentance, the delights of confession. Nick, you're raving. You let me out. You shall stay to the end. The interesting part is just beginning. Do you imagine I don't know all the tricks you're up to, Toby? All your little games? It just isn't getting us anywhere. Oh, what a pretty boy you were when you arrived here, feeling yourself to be so good. Belonging to a community of saints. Oh, but then what happens? Ah, oh, innocent. How quickly he learns. His head is turned. His vanity is tickled. What? He's I... found something more pleasant now than religious fervor. Hmm? A flirtation under the walls of a nunnery. I... What could be more thrilling? So, first he plays the woman, and then, Nick. to make sure he can do both, he plays the man. Stop it, Nick! Stop I've it! I've seen you at it! I've watched your love life in the woods, tempting our virtuous leader to sodomy and our delightful penitence to adultery. It's got nothing to do with you! Hasn't it? After all, we're supposed to be looking after each other, aren't we? What are you going to do about it? That's what I want to know. I... And what about your little frolic with the bell? Hmm? What? Oh, yes. I know all about that. And the little miracle you're planning with your female sweetheart. Oh, stop it, Nick, for God's sake! Shut up, Matthew! I wonder, Toby, if you've any idea of the harm you're causing. Do you think you can play fast and loose with a religious man? You are busy destroying his faith, I'm not. undermining his life, preparing his ruin, and even then you can't give it all your attention, but start playing charades with a bloody bitch! Shut up! Let me go! Down! Down! Down on the floor, Toby, that's where you belong. This, this is the confessional. Only you needn't bother with your confession, as I know it all. It's someone else you've got to tell it to. Someone who doesn't know about it. The joys of penitence await you. But first, first you must taste the cup. Have a swig of whiskey in remembrance of me. No! No! <coughs> Poor child. Poor child. It hurts me to do this. Believe me, it hurts me. It does. But I'm made to be a scourge to certain men. Now, you're going to get up. Come on. Set your clothes to rights. Uh, that's it. And then you're going to be a good boy. And make your confession to the only available saint in this place. James Taper Pets. Why should I do this? The fact is, you have little choice. If by tomorrow you haven't had your little talk with St. James and told him everything... I shall feel it my duty to make a statement. <coughs> now. Go. 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 Wonder what on earth happened to Toby. Even though he didn't get my note, he should still have come to the barn. Three o'clock. I'm cold and I'm wet. There's a light still on at the lodge. Surely he can't be expecting me to turn up there. And I can't very well just barge in. But I could creep up to a window, I suppose, and take a look. Anything's better than just hanging about all night in the rain. Oh, 
I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Foley, but I... I still don't understand what it is you're trying to tell me. Well, I told you all I can. No one must have thought my note was meant for him. Well, he came to the lodge to meet me. But what's he doing with Nick Foley? You say the two members of this community, identity not disclosed, mm -hmm. I found an old bell which used to belong to the Abbey hundreds of years ago, and uh, they're planning some kind of uh, miracle. Hmm. Just to substitute the old bell for the new one. That's it. But, but, but what on earth can I hope to achieve by this? I mean, after all, this is England, not southern Italy. Well, who knows what they expect to achieve. Publicity, perhaps. I told you that the place was appealing for fun, so uh, let me top you up. That's very generous of you. Uh, but now you reckon the, the, the plan won't be carried out? Unfortunately not. One of the parties has lost his nerve. Hmm. <laughs> I must say, the whole, the whole story intrigues me. I, I don't have much sympathy with an outfit like this. Tell me, uh, strictly off the record, of course, what, why are you telling me all this? There are moments when one wants to tell the truth. No one wants to shout it aloud, however much damage it does. And one of those moments is upon me. Hmm. And now, I shall go to bed. And I advise oh. you to do the same. Who knows what may happen tomorrow? Even if the miracle has been called off, there is still the possibility of something quite extraordinary taking place. Oh. Good night. Hello, Murphy. Good night. Up the hill. Come on. The bell is hanging there in the darkness. I can feel it. Almost as if it were alive. Toby's not going to come. And I can't possibly load it onto the trolley all by myself. And I don't know that I want to anymore. Why did Noel have to come here? He's going to turn it all into something silly and nasty and vulgar. When I wanted it to be beautiful and mysterious. And the real trouble is that it'll make everybody at Imber look stupid and ridiculous. And I don't want that anymore. I want everybody to know that I'm the only one who's responsible. But how on earth am I going to do that? I can't very well summon a private press conference. I should have left the bell at the bottom of the lake and not force Toby to drag it up where it could be mocked and made fun of. I should have respected it and been afraid of it. I am afraid of it. I can feel it drawing me to do what it wants to make me tell the truth. The clapper's hanging free. <laughs> With your tape recorder, I see, Mr. Spence. Huh. I hope you managed to get some sleep last night after our little disturbance. Oh, yes, just about, thanks. I can't imagine what Mrs. Greenfield thought she was up to. Mercifully, the bishop slept through it all, didn't hear a thing. Hmm. But I must be off. The ceremony's about to begin. Ah, testing, testing. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right, uh, here we go. It's uh, 20 minutes past seven. It was looking a bit bleary eyed after all the commotion last night. At least it stopped raining. So, what have we got? Well, for, for a start, we've got a crowd of several hundred people to watch the fun and games. Uh, girls and quarter band has just struck up. Bishop's standing beside the bell and he's all the way in there. Ah, here come the Morris dancers. Now well, you've got the full works. Hobby Horse and the Fool. And the Trimmings. Looks as if someone's told me to cool a bit. 
Now, the bishop's going to say a few words. Welcome, dear friends, welcome. This is an event that will long be remembered in the annals of this ancient abbey, the coming of a new bell after more than four centuries. Let us join together to escort the bell on the last stage of its journey to the gates of the abbey, where it will be received like a postulant seeking admission to this holy place. And the uh, bell on its trolley is starting to move off down the slope towards the causeway. Got two pairs of workmen pulling it and another two trying to control it. We must be quite a wait. Most men look as though they don't know whether they should be dancing or not. And there's Dora, looking distinctly the worse for wear. God knows why Paul's got to. He sent me down last night. He was so interested in the bell, I didn't even seem to notice Dora. The nuns are opening the gates of the abbey. Uh, the bell is slowly being trundled across the causeway. The bishop's striding ahead very purposefully. The little girls in white dresses looking distinctly cold. Only wishing they were back home in bed. The bell has reached the wooden section in the middle of the causeway. And is going slowly across. Something seems to have gone wrong. The, the bell seems to be tilting to one side. The, the, the supports are giving way. The, the, the bell's going over sideways. It, it's going into the lake. The bell has vanished under the water. Now what's going on? The, the girl who's, who's the bell's uh, godmother or whatever looks as if she's going berserk. She's she's running off alongside of the lake. <laughs> Good old Dora's going after her. Catherine! Catherine, stop! What the hell are you doing? Leave me alone. Go away. What's the matter? What's wrong? It was because of me. Don't you understand? What was because of me? The bell... You didn't know, did you? It was a sign. What do you mean? A sign? Why can't you just leave me alone? Because I'm frightened you're going to do something silly. What if I do? God has reached out his hand. A white garment cannot conceal a wicked heart. There is no passing through that gate. Do you mean you're not going to be a nun anymore? When the bell flew from the tower all those centuries ago, it was because a nun had betrayed her vows. Through the lust of the flesh. But you can't have betrayed anything. You're not even a nun yet. To God, all our secret desires are known. He has seen into my heart and knows that it is corrupted by sinful lust. By lust for Michael. Michael? That is why God caused the bell to fall into the lake. And now... I must make my expiation. I must do what the other sinful creature did. Catherine, this is ridiculous. Leave me. Catherine, stop. Help. Help. Get out of me. Don't stop playing, Catherine. I can't. She's all right. She's going to be fine. Oh. Mr. Mark, hmm? was it you that rescued me? Oh, no. You've got Mother Claire to thank for that. Yes, yes, yes. She's um, over there. We always said you ought to meet her. And now you have. I have never seen a nun in her underclothes. Mother Claire is not the kind of person to give any thought to a thing like that. And Catherine, will she be all right? That rather remains to be seen. She didn't come to any harm. 
If that's what you mean. Catherine. Uh, you all right? Michael. <coughs> Michael. Michael. I love you. Read it. What do you mean? Read what your lover has written about us all. Just take a look at it. You see? He has compared your little escapade to something more reminiscent of a witch's Sabbath than the sober goings-on of the Anglican church. Yes, I can see. Well, take a look at what he's said about the loss of the bell. Subsequent investigations suggest that sabotage and not accident was responsible for the disaster... And the finger of suspicion is pointed at one of the brothers. But who? Well, I was hoping that you would tell me. Was it your doing? Of course not. Scarce, however, had this mystery been allowed to thicken when a sister, who was shortly herself to proceed across Ember Causeway to nunhood, became deranged and threw herself into the lake. Happily, she was rescued quite unhurt by Miss Dora Greenfield. A visitor to the Abbey, with the help of an aquatic nun, who provided a unique spectacle by doffing her habit and diving in in her underclothes. The unfortunate would-be suicide is receiving medical attention. You realise the untold damage all this has done to the community? They've been made to look ridiculous, and God knows what harm this may have done to the appeal. Are you pleased with your achievement? Not very. Not very. You mean you're a little pleased? I'm not pleased at all. And you still say you had nothing to do with what happened to the new bell? Nothing. I wonder why I ask you questions when I never believe what you say. Oh, do stop, Paul. What's going to happen? How do you mean? To the others. To Catherine. Well, Mrs. Mark is taking her up to London to see a psychiatrist, which is what you should do. I'm beginning to wonder whether you aren't mentally ill. I won't see a psychiatrist. You will if I decide you will. And what are you going to do? I shall be catching the ten o'clock train to London. I had a call from the British Museum, and they are enormously interested in the old bell, and they want to hear all about it. You can stay here to pack and bring our luggage up to London tomorrow. I shall, however, take the precaution of taking my notebooks up with me. I shall expect you at Knightsbridge tomorrow at three o'clock. Mark Strafford said you wanted to have a word. Um, yes. Thank you for coming so promptly, Michael. Did Catherine get off all right? Um, yes, she did. So, what was it you wanted to see me about, James? Uh, I'm sorry, Michael... This is very difficult. What's the matter? Has something new happened? Well, yes and no. You see, Toby has told me everything. What did he tell you? Well, you know. What happened between you? Very little happened. Well, that is a matter of opinion. All right, you've learned something about me. I'm sorry. Now, when did Toby make this confession to you? The night before last. He came to my room sometime after 11 o'clock. He'd been wandering about in the rain and was frightfully upset. We talked for hours. He told me all about the bell business. What did you say to Toby? Well, I was pretty severe with him. I thought he behaved foolishly, even in some ways badly, in relation to you and Dora. And I told him so. And where is Toby now? Now I sent him home. You perfect imbecile. When did he go? He went off on the train this morning. I'm sorry I wasn't able to raise this with you before, but there was so much happening I had to make a decision. I thought that it was better he shouldn't see you again. And I thought he should go while he felt, as it were, that he'd got back to some sort of innocence. If he'd stayed and had a talk with you, he'd have just fallen back into the mess again, if you see what I mean. Why did you say I was an imbecile? There was no need to be so damn solemn... The real blame belongs to me. By sending Toby away, you've made him feel like a criminal and made the whole business into 
It's a tremendous catastrophe. I don't see why he shouldn't take his full share of the responsibility. He's quite old enough. I wonder why he suddenly took it into his head to confess to you. Well, why shouldn't he? I think what immediately made up his mind were some things that Nick Foley said. What? Apparently Nick knew all about it and told him he ought to earn up. <laughs> the first sensible thing Nick's done since his arrival, if you ask me. Well, that appears to be that. I'm sorry if I've seemed cross. I regard myself as very much to blame. And of course, I shall resign or do whatever else one does to get away from him. But... Oh, but surely there is... I'm sorry to disturb you, but I think something may have happened to Nick. I was down at the ferry and I heard a funny noise coming from the lodge. I think it's Murphy howling. I thought I'd better warn you. I'll go down there. Oh, straight away. Nick? Oh, my God. Nick. What's happened? Nick has shot himself. Is he dead? He put the barrel of the shotgun in his mouth. Oh, God. You... Go and phone the police, Mark. I'll stay here. Right. A few minutes ago, I was so sure that Nick's revenge could not be more perfect. He had destroyed me twice. In exactly the same way. I could not have been more wrong. Now, your revenge is complete. Oh, Nick. Oh. <laughs> so, what will happen now? The community can't possibly go on after this. No. We might have managed to weather the disaster over the new bell and Catherine's attempt to drown herself. Not to mention your own little escapade. But Nick's suicide really writes finis over the whole enterprise. Imber simply cannot survive. It was Nick, of course, who saw through the timber supports on the wooden section of the causeway. I couldn't think of anyone else who would have done it. But where will everybody go? <laughs> I shall go back to my community work in the East End of London. Peter Topglass is going to join an ornithological survey in the Faroe Islands. And Mr. and Mrs. Mark are going to join a crafts workshop attached to a monastery in Cumberland. And Mr. Mead? I have no idea what plans Michael may be making for himself. For a while he'll be staying on to wind everything up. Someone's got to decide what's to become of the market garden. And I understand a crane is arriving at the end of the week to lift the bell out of the lake, if it can be managed. But since you and Toby managed to bring the old bell to the surface single-handed, so to speak, it shouldn't be good. What's going to happen to it? Happen to what? To my... to the old bell. It's going up to London by road rail container to be examined by experts. Your husband is very excited about it. You'll be going back to join him, I take it? I don't know. Not just yet, anyway. I thought I might stay on here for as long as I can to make myself useful. Useful? <laughs> and just what do you think you could do that would be useful to anyone? Oh, I can run errands and wash and dust and tidy and generally help out. I could do the cooking. But you don't even know how to boil an egg. I can learn. I might never have the chance again. You are being childishly self-indulgent, Dora. You know very well that your place is here with me. To do what? To sit and look at your medieval ivories? To be the mother of my children, Dora. I don't know whether I'm ready for that yet. I don't want to come back. Because I know that I would only run away again. I want to live and work on my own for a bit. I want to become an independent, grown-up person. Grown-up? And how do you think you're ever going to manage to do that? I never knew you were a painter, Dora. I'm not. I'm not much good at it, but I keep on trying. I want to show how the shadow of the tower falls across the abbey wall. But I'm making rather a mess of it. 
Have you had any proper training? Oh, yes. Three years of it. At the Slade. But I spent most of my time dressing up and going to parties. <laughs> I never took it very seriously. And then Paul came along, and that was that. He gave it all up. Have you thought any more about going back to Paul? Oh, yes. I've thought about it. I've even had a chat to Mother Claire about it. But it's not good. Everything to do with Paul is just the kiss of death. I couldn't live with him again unless he treated me as an equal. And he's never likely to do that. And in any case, I've got better things to do. What kind of things? Finding me, I suppose. I've managed to cook a bit. A bit? <laughs> I'm learning to swim. I played some Mozart records the other evening and found that I enjoyed them. <laughs> you certainly are a survivor, Dora. You seem to have positively thrived on all the disasters that have knocked the rest of us for six. Oh, and by the way, um, I've had a letter from Toby. <gasps> Is he all right? He'll be at college now, I suppose. Yes. He sounds very happy. He's covered the walls of his room with pictures of the medieval bell that he cut out of the illustrated London news. <laughs> his tutor was tremendously impressed when Toby told him how he discovered it. Did he mention me? No, he didn't, I'm afraid, Dora. He seems to have put all of us out of his thoughts. It hurts me to think of the bell having to spend the rest of its life in some dusty museum. I wanted it to be free, to ring out to the world. And now it's shut away from everything like Paul's medieval ivories. I shouldn't have presumed to touch it. You know, Dora, that picture of yours really isn't at all bad. There's an old friend of mine who runs a college of art in Bath. How would it be if I were to have a word with him, see if he could sort out a ground for you or something like that? In Bath? <laughs> but that would be marvellous. Sally, she's my best friend, has just got a job as a teacher there, and she's looking for someone to share a flat with her. It would be simply wonderful. I'll give him a ring tonight. And now I must go over to the Abbey, Dora. I've got a meeting with the Abbess. <laughs> I cannot take away from you the responsibility you feel for Nick Fawley's death, my son. Nor can I teach you how to live with it. That, with God's grace, you must learn for yourself. I know that. I don't want to put it away from me, or to forget it for a single moment. I feel like one of the sinners in Dante's purgatory, who wish to stay forever within the purifying fire. I should have helped Nick, and I could have helped him. I denied him and kept away. I was too worried about keeping my hands clean and keeping my future here secure. I should have reached out to him and, and I turned away. What is so terrible is that now that he is dead, I have come to love him as I never did when he was alive. And his sister, Catherine? I don't know. Every day I expect to get a message from Margaret Strafford telling me that Catherine's well enough to see me. And do you wish to see her? I don't know. I cannot rid myself of a feeling of aversion. I can't forget that terrible kiss she planted on my lips after she'd been pulled out of the lake. There are times when I wish that it were she who was dead and not Nick. But at the same time, I pity her. And I know that until the end of my life, I must be concerned with her and responsible for her welfare. Nick has gone, and Catherine remains. I must not walk away from her. And when will you leave here? As soon as she sends for me. And do you know what you will do? I have a temporary job in a secondary school in Norfolk. But, of course, everything depends on my meeting with Catherine. Until then... I can decide nothing. I shall pray for you, my son. And I shall pray for Catherine. I shall pray to God to give you both guidance. It's foggy. I hope your train's not going to be late. So do I. Margaret Mark's meeting me at Paddington. Oh, you will give my love to Catherine, won't you? Surely I will. I do hope she'll be all right. You're oh. shivering. Haven't you got a winter coat? No. Well, it's in the flat in Knightsbridge. 
It doesn't matter. I'm not a cold person. You can't go through the winter in a thin Macintosh. You'd better buy a proper coat. Now, do let me lend you the money. But I'm not short. No, of course not. I shall make out very well on my grant. And Sally's going to get me a part-time job teaching. When are you going? Not till this afternoon. I'm catching the 4.30. Don't forget to give your key to Sister Ursula before you go. <laughs> what will happen to Imber now we've all left it? Didn't you tell me once that it was yours? I'm going to lease it indefinitely to the Abbey. To the Abbey? And what will they do with it? Live in it. They've needed more space for a long time. Oh, dear. There's your train. Oh, I do wish you weren't going. Oh, come on, Dora. <laughs> Cheer up. Oh, I know. I'm silly. But I shall miss you so much. These last few weeks have been the best time of my life. We'll write to one another. <laughs> I'd better get in. I never really thanked you about Bath. I could never have managed it without you. I'm glad it worked out. I'm really looking forward to it. I've never been in the West Country. What does one drink there? West Country Cider. Why are you pulling that face? Isn't it nice? It's nice, but it's very strong. <laughs> I shouldn't take too much of it if I were you. I shall telephone Sally to get a large jug of it. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, Michael. And don't forget to give Catherine my love. I won't. Goodbye. Goodbye, Dora. <sighs> Goodbye. <laughs> The old house looks terribly empty now, as if all the life had finally gone out of it. I am glad that Michael and Catherine won't be coming to live here, or their children. And when I leave to catch my train, no one from the world outside will ever see Imber again. It will be enclosed within the abbey and cut off from the world. But just for this one last moment, it belongs to me. It's mine. And the new bell is up there in the tower, ringing out as if it had been there always. Already, it sounds as if it were ringing from another world. And tonight, I shall be telling Sally all about it. And drinking Michael's health in West Country Cider. Part three of The Bell, Michael Mead was played by Crispin Redman, Paul Greenfield, Nicholas Farrell, Nick Forley, Nicholas Bolton, and James Taper Pace by Philip Voss. Mrs. Mark was played by Jane Booker, The Abbess, Janet Sussman, Dora Greenfield, Catherine Bradshaw, and Noel Spens by Charlie Simpson. The Bishop was played by Norman Rodway, Catherine Forley, Emma Gregory, Toby Gash, Jamie Bamba, and Mark Strafford by Matthew Morgan. Original music was composed by Elizabeth Parker. Iris Murdoch's The Bell was dramatized by Michael Bakewell, directed by Jane Morgan, and is a Catherine Bailey production for BBC Radio 4.